Okay, thank you very much, Sergio, for the introduction, and, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you about some of the exciting work that's been going on in the optics division uh, of the Martino Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. So first, I'd just like to echo what Sergio was saying. You know, SBI has launched this new uh, journal, Neurophotonics. I'm very excited about it. It sits at the interface of optics and neuroscience and will provide a focal point for publishing uh, uh, and capturing a number of the exciting uh, 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 scientific uh, progress that's being made in, in this rapidly developing field. So during my talk, there are two main points uh, I want you to get. Uh, one, that there's a, a number of exciting advances in, in microscopy that are giving us new t detailed insight into uh, uh, how oxygen is being delivered to the tissue at the microscopic level. I'd like you to uh, uh, learn a little bit about that. And the other is how we can take those measurements to build a bottom-up model of how fMRI um, is, is measuring uh, oxygenation with the brain and, and how we can validate uh, those uh, fMRI measurements of cerebral oxygenation. So when we think about how oxygen is delivered to tissue, it'd be really nice if, if life was simple and we had a, a nice uniform capillary network that delivered oxygen to the tissue in a uniform fashion. But in reality, the capillary network is very complex, very heterogeneous. There are short path lengths through the capillary network uh, with high flow, and then there are longer path lengths with low flow. And this heterogeneous uh, nature of the capillary flow patterns give rise to a heterogeneous oxygenation. And that really creates some complexities that, uh, when coupled actually with capillary dysfunction in, in aging, can lead to a number of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So we've been developing a multimodal microscope that can really allow us to look at these microscopic details of oxygen and blood flow within the microvascular capillary network. So we're doing two photon microscopy of a novel phosphorescent agent that is quenched by oxygen. And this way we can get uh, maps of the partial pressure of oxygen. So here you can see uh, uh, one representative image of the phosphorescent agent. You can pick out a vein and an artery. And you can see the lifetime of the phosphorescence um, um, from those vessels. And you see that the artery in red has a, a shorter lifetime because the greater abundance of oxygen is consuming, is quenching the agent. So that lifetime is quantitatively related to PO2. And in that way, we get a quantitative value for the partial pressure of oxygen. Because this is two-photon microscopy, it's very easy now to actually raster scan around to multiple points and map uh, oxygen throughout the vascular network. That's being coupled now with OCT. Um, you can do an OCT angiogram, get a volumetric map of the vascular network. You can do Doppler OCT. You can quantify blood flow uh, in the arteries and the veins. These are re representative uh, images from Vivek Srinivasan, but these, these methods are routine, and a number of groups are doing them now. But what we really want to do is extend these methods to measure the flow characteristics in the capillary network, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So here's a representative image we're able to get of the PO2 distribution within the cortex of a mouse. Um, so we've measured PO2 at multiple points, and then we interpolate between those points. You can really follow smoothly the distribution of oxygen from the arterioles with high oxygenation into the capillary network and then draining into the veins. So we've done this over multiple mice. We can get the statistics now and plot for you oxygenation in the arterioles at different diameters and in the veins in different diameters. So the first thing that pops out at you is that actually significant oxygen is extracted from the arterioles. So this goes against the textbook uh, description of oxygen being delivered to tissue by capillaries. What we actually see from these data is that 50% of the oxygen being delivered to the tissue is actually coming from the arterioles. So that's one interesting new physiological insight that we're getting about oxygen delivery. The other is that the veins, um, at the, in the smallest veins, have a very low SO2. And then as we go to uh, um, downstream venules, larger diameter, you see a larger and larger SO2. And this 60, 65 percent is really a typical SO2 value that you see um, in the veins. It's quite interesting, though, in the smallest veins, it's much smaller. And this comes back to this heterogeneity um, that I'll explain in more detail on the next slide. So if we focus now just on the capillary uh, hemoglobin oxygen saturation profile, this is related to the partial pressure of oxygen, you can see that on average, capillaries have an incredibly low SO2. This was very surprising to us when we first measured it. We thought capillaries should have a higher SO2 than the veins. 
You know, the venous SO2 is about 62% in this case on average, but on average, the capillaries are 20 to 40% uh, hemoglobin oxygen saturation. And the reason that is happening is, is because of this heterogeneity. The uh, short path length capillaries have high flow and high oxygenation, but the long path length capillaries have low flow and low oxygenation, right? So spatially, there's more low flow, long path length capillaries, but the veins are really representing the flow weighted average of the SO2. And so it's those high flow, high oxygenated capillaries that really dominate the venous SO2. So we really see this very interesting distribution here. Now, um, this arises because of that complex interplay between the heterogeneity of blood flow within the capillaries and this heterogeneity of oxygenation within the capillaries. So we really need methods so we can measure uh, blood flow within the capillary network. So Zheng Wan Li is developing a novel OCT method to look at this in more detail. So if we take this angiogram and now take a slice in depth, so here you see a slice in depth of that angiogram, you can pick out capillaries. So if you repeat this B scan um, for several seconds, what you'll see is this, in each capillary, you're gonna see blips. Each one of those blips is actually the passage of a red blood cell. And as that blood cell goes through the plane, it increases the backscatter of the OCT signal. So you can actually count these blips and get the flux of red blood cells through that capillary segment. If you measure the width of the blip, you get the speed of the red blood cell. So now if you just raster scan um, this plane over the volume of the vascular network, we can now relatively quickly map out the red blood cell speed and flux throughout hundreds of capillary segments. So now you can begin to see, this is beginning to tell us about the heterogeneity of blood, thro blood flow throughout the microvascular network. So if you want to see more details of that, I encourage you to go see Zhang Wan Li's uh, talks on Monday and Tuesday. So for the second part of my talk, I'd like to tell you how we're bringing all of these microscopic measurements together to build a model of the fMRI measurement of blood oxygenation in the human brain. So bold fMRI measures changes in blood oxygenation, typically during brain activation tasks. The physiological interpretation of bold fMRI is not quantitatively validated, although it's used you know, widely around the world. So with these models, we're building a ground truth simulator of bold fMRI to guide quantitative physiological interpretation of the signals, while at the same time actually guiding the development of novel MRI methods to measure cerebral oxygenation. So we start off with this vascular network. We can calculate flow through that vascular network. Given flow, you can now calculate the oxygenation. That's oxygen that's advecting through the vessels and diffusing into the tissue where it's consumed. We can compare that with experimental measurements. And looking at the statistics, we can see actually very good agreement between arterial oxygenation and venous oxygenation during different branch orders. Now we can take you know, independent measurements of, of how the cerebral arteries respond to brain activation. We do this with two-photon microscopy during a sensory stimulation in rodents. So we can see this arterial dilation that we can put into our model and simulate how the oxygenation in the brain is going to respond to this brain activation task. So that gives us then the oxygenation changes happening in the arteries and the veins. We have, over the years, made measurements of this by independent methods, and we see very good agreement between the simulations uh, and the experiments. So finally, now we have deoxyhemoglobin throughout the vascular network, and that changing over time in response to a brain activation task. Deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic. It um, perturbs the magnetic field in an MRI scanner. Um, that perturbed magnetic field is then going to modulate uh, the dephasing of nuclear spins that are diffusing around the vascular network, and that gives rise to the fMRI signal that you measure with bold. So we, we predict this bold response that we would see in response to this brain activation, you know, giving rise to arterial dilation. We perform these experiments with bold fMRI, and, and the experimental results agree very well with the, the simulations. So we've now validated this model, and we can now begin to make some predictions. So the first thing we looked at is, how does the bold signal change versus the field strength of the magnet? And what we saw was one thing very striking was that actually it depended on the orientation of the magnetic field relative to the surface of the brain. And so the surface of the brain has large um, veins that have a lot of deoxyhemoglobin content, and that introduces a preferred direction 
for this bold signal change. What was surprising was that it, our model predicted a 40% signal change. So we thought we should be able to measure that in humans. So you can measure you know, the human brain anatomy quite nicely with MRI, and you can calculate then the angle of the sur surface of the brain with respect to the magnetic field. So then we presented a physiological challenge to the subject, hypercapnia, to increase deoxy or decrease deoxyhemoglobin content uh, uniformly over the brain. And then we were able to plot the bold signal change versus angle. Um, with respect to the magnetic field, and lo and behold, we saw this 40% signal change that was predicted by the model. So we have this physiological model that has predictive power um, and can really help us now better quantitatively interpret fMRI and will be very useful for developing new MRR methods to quantify cerebral oxygenation. So that I'd like to just summarize by thanking the, uh, the excellent group of people I've been able to work with over the years, particularly Sava Sakadzic, who is developing the that uh, PO2 measurements, Zhang Wan Li and Vivek Srinivasan, who are advancing the OCT, uh, and Louis Ganong, who is working on the modeling. And I'd like to thank the funding agencies and thank you for your attention.